Hello and welcome back to our final episode of G-Week for this semester. For our last episode, we'll be covering stories from the latest in Ukraine to the reopening of DC Metro's Yellow Line. We'll also dive into GW's Student Association election and King Charles's coronation. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the show. I'm Emma Grace Myers. And I'm Morgan Miller. Unfortunately, this is my last episode as anchor, but there is no shortage of news, so let's jump right into it. Last week, Fox abruptly agreed to settle a defamation suit with Dominion Voting Systems for $787.5 million. This last-minute settlement comes just as a packed courtroom was seated in anticipation of hearing opening statements, ending the lawsuit over the network's promotion of misinformation about the 2020 election. The settlement is one of the largest ever in a defamation case, and is just the latest extraordinary twist in a case that has been full of striking disclosures that expose the inner workings of one of the most powerful voices in conservative news. In addition to the huge financial price, Dominion exacted a difficult admission from Fox News, which acknowledged in a statement that, quote, certain claims, end quote, it made about Dominion were, in fact, false. However, no further admission was made regarding claims of disinformation. The ongoing war in Ukraine continues impacting the lives of vulnerable citizens within areas of conflict ensued by the Russian government. G-Week reporter Pravina Kotka has the updates. The Russo-Ukrainian conflict advanced into war on February 24, 2022, with Russia's invasion occupation of Ukraine. Since the invasion over a year ago, both sides have suffered immense casualties as the bloody toll of the war continues to rise. U.S. News reports that as of April 12, 2023, as many as 354,000 Russian and Ukrainian soldiers have been killed or injured. The aggression from Russia against Ukraine as an independent state began as early as 2014 in the seizing of the Ukrainian Crimean Peninsula territory. Today, Russia's declaration of war has led to detrimental economic and humanitarian impacts, killing or displacing thousands of citizens seeking refuge. As the world continues to navigate through battered economies brought upon by the war and pandemic, Russia continues to strengthen its ties with China, North Korea, and Iran, while suffering through the economic losses imposed through sanctions and the Iron Curtain established by the West and NATO. The onset of war has brought about an age of uncertainty, especially regarding the future of Euro European relations and millions of Ukrainians forced to flee their homes. CNN remains a prominent source of information on the war, providing live updates. As of April 16, 2022, top headlines include the rising death toll from Russia's recent attack in Slovyansk, the quote, unprecedented battle in Bekhmut, end quote, and Russia's consistent attacks on the Ukrainian Eastern Front. Recent articles report on the denouncement of Hungary and Poland in banning Ukrainian grain by the EU the prison swap of 130 Ukrainian soldiers, and an address delivered by Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, where he denounces the bombing of a church in the, east, in the city of Zaporizhia on Easter. As Ukraine continues defending its homeland against Russian invaders, the Western European Union continues supporting Ukraine through financial, military, and humanitarian support, seeking an end to the devastating war. For G-Week, I'm Pravina Kodka. Thanks, Pravina. On Thursday, April 13th, Interim University President Mark Wrighton emailed the student body covering new safety procedures for the university. These included new electronic access to lockdown buildings in case of an emergency, a new emergency notification system, and most controversial, a quote, implementation plan for arming specially trained GWPD supervisory officers, end quote. This decision led to student outcry, leading to a march down F Street from Kogan Plaza on April 17th, with nearly 150 students representing 20 different on-campus organizations, according to the GW Hatchet. Students marched with drums and so signs, shouting, quote, no justice, no peace, no racist police, end quote, during the hour-long demonstration. A petition to get the decision overturned as has nearly 540 signatures as of Tuesday, April 19th. There has been no official statements from the university following the protest. While the semester comes to an end, it is time to look forward to what lies ahead. And with that comes the student association election. Many students set their sights on the improvements that needed to be made within the school. Katherine Saranchak has the story. 
This past week, students voted to determine the Student Association President, Vice President, and Senators. Many of the candidates had reforms ranging from the betterment of advising to making sure the dining halls have better access for those with dietary restrictions. The election took place over April 13th through the 14th, with students voting via Engage and ranking the candidates. The results were read out loud on Saturday, April 15th, with the most prominent decision being the President and Vice President. The winner of President was Ariel Geismer, and Vice President was Demetrius Apostolos. However, some were confused when the election and voting was pushed back. Here to talk about this and his own experience with the campaign is Rami Hanash Jr. Um, I decided when I first got here to GW, I figured that Student Association President was something that I can make a big impact with and something that I could really make a difference with. And so that's something I set my sights on. I joined the Student Association my freshman year, started working for the executive branch, and then I ran for Senate was a senator my sophomore year, and then decided to run. I feel like it was a bit smoother in years past, but this year we got through it. Um, I feel like the presidential campaign was really smooth. Um, the debate was pretty straightforward. It was mostly Q&A. Uh, it was just a little rocky with all the delays and date times and changes and whatnot. I think that the deadline for the JEC appointment should be sooner and then that way they'll have ample time to prepare for the election. I wasn't too upset. I understood that they had a lot to deal with and that there was a lot of drama and cases going on, but uh, they handled it pretty well and they delayed it once, just two weeks, and they stuck to that date and they held it out. I think going forward, the SA has Big shoes to fill, especially with last year not really being a great year for the SA. Um, our reputation isn't the greatest, and so Ariel and Demetrius have a big challenge in front of them, but it's just going to take hard work and true dedication. And it's going to start from the top. But it was a good race. Congrats to both Ariel Geismer and Demetrius Apostolos for winning. Um, the SA is in good hands. Thank you, Rami, for speaking with us today. Signing off for GWTV, I'm Catherine Sarantek. Thanks, Catherine. On April 13th, 84-year-old Kansas City resident Andrew Lester shot 16-year-old Ralph Yarl after Yarl accidentally rang the wrong doorbell while picking up his siblings from a friend's home. Lester shot Yarl twice, once in both the arm and the head. Described as a, quote, walking miracle, end quote, by family spokesperson and advocate Sean King, Jarl has received a, quote, positive prognosis, end quote, regarding his physical injuries. Following his arrest, Lester pled not guilty on felony charges, including assault in the first degree and armed criminal action. Lester stated that he felt he was in immediate danger before shooting Jarl. However, Jarl's lawyer claims the shooting was racially motivated. While Lester remains on bail, he is prohibited from making contact with Jarl's family and accessing firearms. As the family of Jarl continues to heal, a GoFundMe started by his aunt has already raised over $3 million to help pay for Jarl's therapy and treatment. On May 6th, the coronation of King Charles III will take place at Westminster Abbey, the first coronation in 70 years. Members of the royal family, British politicians, and celebrities will all be in attendance. According to People magazine, Prince Harry will be attending in support of his father, with Meghan Markle, Duchess of Sussex, staying home with their children, celebrating eldest child Prince Archie's fourth birthday. According to the BBC, the coronation is simply a traditional ceremony symbolizing the monarch's commitment to the country because they legally assumed the throne following the death of their predecessor. Celebrations will be held over multiple days and will include parades, concerts, and service projects. The coronation ceremony will start at 6 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, followed by a procession back to Buckingham Palace. Following a leak of classified documents from the Department of Defense, the Biden administration is under fire from Republican opponents. Preston Summit has the story. Earlier this month, classified papers relating to the Russo-Ukrainian war were leaked to the public. The Department of Defense further stated that the documents contain information regarding foreign countries, according to CBS News. While the United States government has attempted to remove the documents from social media sites, further stating that they are unsure of their validity, many remain open to the public. In a statement on the issue, President Joe Biden stated, quote, there's nothing contemporaneous that I'm aware of that is of great consequence, end quote. Biden further remarked that a full investigation was ongoing regarding the leak. 
On Thursday, April 13th, AP News reported that a Massachusetts Air National Guard member was arrested in connection to the leak. The member is 21-year-old Jack Teixeira after being arrested at his home. AP News further states, quote, the online private chat group where the documents were disclosed have depicted Teixeira as motivated more by bravado than ideology, end quote. According to BBC, Teixeira, who received top secret clearance in 2021, has been formally accused of, quote, unauthorized retention and transmission of national defense information and the unauthorized removal and retention of classified documents, end quote, and now faces up to 15 years in prison. Following the leak, Republican Party members have criticized the Biden administration over the issue. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy took to Twitter, writing, quote, The Biden administration has failed to secure classified information. Through our committees, Congress will get answers as to why they were asleep at the switch, end quote. Other Republican congressional members have utilized social media to criticize the administration. Regarding the leak, the Federal Bureau of Investigation stated, quote, Since late last week, the FBI has aggressively pursued investigative leads, and today's arrest exemplifies our continued commitment to identifying, pursuing, and holding accountable those who betray our country's trust and put our national security at risk, end quote. For G-Week, I'm Preston Summit. Thanks, Preston. After fans were disappointed with Frank Ocean's first performance in almost six years as the headliner for Coachella in Weekend 1, he has announced that he will not be performing Weekend 2. According to a statement given to TMZ, Ocean suffered a leg injury on the festival grounds and is unable to perform Weekend 2 because of two fractures and a sprain in his left leg. According to Variety magazine, Frank stated, quote, It was chaotic. There was some beauty in chaos. It isn't what I intended to show, but I did enjoy being out there, and I'll see you soon." End quote. Blink-182 is scheduled to take his spot during the second weekend. Over the last eight months, certain users of the DC Metro have had to find other means of travel while the Yellow Line is closed. However, with the construction project having now completed, Yellow Line trains are now scheduled to roll once again through Virginia and downtown DC. Byung So has the story. Users of the Metro Rail have a lot to look forward to come May as the long-awaited reopening for the Metro's Yellow Line has been scheduled for May 7th at 7 a.m. This event will mark the completion of an eight-month construction project on the line, which involved the repair of a 40-year-old tunnel and a bridge. In a statement from the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority, General Manager and Chief Executive Officer Randy Clark, quote, I want to thank our customers for their patience while we completed this critical work to ensure a safe and reliable service for decades to come. Clark also thanked, quote, the dedicated men and women who worked to deliver this complex project on schedule and on budget, end quote. According to the WMATA plans, the reopening of the Yellow Line will increase Metro service to downtown Washington, D.C., while also ending the previous shuttle bus service that had substituted for the closed service. Additionally, on May 19th, the long-awaited Potomac Yard Station in Virginia will open in time for fully restored yellow and blue line services. I'm Byung So from G-Week. Back to you guys in the studio. Thanks, Byung. On April 18th, a toddler crawled through a five and a half inch gap in the White House fence and onto the grounds. After the infant triggered several alarms and a momentary lockdown, the Secret Service quickly responded by reuniting the child with his parents. A spokesperson for the Secret Service said, quote, we were going to wait until he learned to talk to question him, but in lieu of that, he got a timeout and was sent on way with parents." End quote. Next, G Week's own Sam Rajesh will be joining us for a special segment. Stay tuned. Hi everyone and welcome back to the talk show. I'm your host Sam Rajesh and it's so great to be back in the studio for another episode. As you might have figured out by now, I love having guests from a variety of backgrounds, and I particularly love uplifting other South Asian women and watching them shine in whatever they do. So today we're really lucky to have the founder of Caregiver on the show. So Nishi Bhagat is a cognitive science student at UC Davis who is passionate about revolutionizing caregiving and addressing its existing challenges through digital solutions. Her venture caregiver aims to lessen the caregiving burden and be the go-to resource that everyone invested in a care recipient's well-being can turn to. The app provides a collaborative calendar for caregivers to work with others and manage the care recipient's needs whilst prioritizing their own. The app also offers a social media platform where caregivers can find community and resources. Hi Nishi, thank you so much for being here today. 
Thank you for having me. This is so exciting. Awesome. So my first question is, what informed this interest in revolutionizing caregiving? Yeah, so I was involved in the neurodivergent community in high school when I volunteered with the music program for special education students. So I have started learning about caregiver challenges from pretty early on in high school. And in college, I actually worked in a lab where we studied caregiver cognitive decline. And so I spent a lot of time looking at this problem in many different facets. And so when I got to learn more about entrepreneurship, I knew I wanted to use like these two interests that I had to bring a solution to something that I had spent so long studying in so many different ways. That's awesome. So why do you believe in the power of digital platforms and technology in addressing these social challenges like caregiving? I think these social challenges are so multifaceted. Something as comprehensive as a digital platform um, and technology is really the most powerful way to meet like all of these different needs that each problem has. Um, and it provides the most efficient and comprehensive solution. I couldn't agree more. So what has been the most rewarding and challenging aspect of this whole journey for you? I think like being able to talk to the actual individuals who are impacted by caregiving challenges has been both the most like rewarding and challenging aspect because listening to their stories isn't always easy. What has it been like being a young Indian woman um, and how that how that has shaped your lived experience with regards to starting a venture like this, but also in general as a woman in STEM. Yeah, definitely. So I don't think it's any secret that, you know, South Asian women in general don't have a lot of representation in the entrepreneurship ecosystem. So I think in the beginning, it definitely is really intimidating going out and trying these new things when there's not a lot of people who look like you who have succeeded in the past. But that being said, I think I'm incredibly, incredibly grateful for all the mentors in the community that um, we've had supporting us because they never let us um, down. They've always been there for us and they're always so encouraging. And so I think whenever you are starting a venture or trying new things, having people who support you and believe in you can make a world of difference. So I think that's the biggest thing I'd love to highlight is just how grateful I am for everyone who has been able to support me. And also like finding places and communities where there are people who um, you know, share the same values as you and are also driven helps you stay focused to what your main goal is. Awesome. So how do you stay resilient when you meet detours or roadblocks in pursuing your venture, especially as a student who probably has a lot on her plate? Um, I think always taking time for yourself is good. I think when you get too overwhelmed, you know, if you don't put yourself first, um, there's nothing else that you can really do. But um, other than like, you know, taking care of yourself and, you know, your mental health, I think being able to stay true to the overall vision and realizing that whenever a roadblock does come up it's often just a roadblock right there's always going to be more opportunities there's always going to be um other things that will you know work out so remembering the bigger picture in mind um helps me stay resilient through the losses that come my way i love that perspective so what is your 60 second pitch when you meet somebody and you want to share the work that you do um i normally say um, caregiving exact significant tolls on each caregiver, with up to 70% of caregivers having symptoms of depression, and there being 53 million in the U.S. alone, there's a grim picture of how burdensome this role can be. Caregiver is a wellness app that is designed to holistically decrease caregiver challenges. Caregivers can log on to our app to ensure a positive caregiving experience through our specialized features such as our social media, our self-check-in, and our collaborative calendar, that all provide a holistic and care-centric approach to solving their problems. I love that. I love that. If I was a venture capitalist, you, you have all my money. <laughs> You're um, so sweet. <laughs> so what would you say to people who don't see the value in this app or are critical based um, on these solutions to, to challenges in caregiving? Before starting this venture, we did a lot of market research. We talked to like over 120 customers. Um, and so we know that there is a need in the marketplace and this solution is a start to solving caregiver challenges and we hope that caregiver challenges only have more resources come their way so even if this isn't the perfect solution um, we hope that it's a start. I know that we've met at a pitch competition so can you share a little bit about your experience uh, with gaining funding, pitching, and representing your venture at various forums? How has that been like for you? I think it's been a really cool learning opportunity. I think there's a lot that 
we learn from going out and seeking different funding sources, pitching, um, and like, you know, just representing your venture, like even beyond just learning like entrepreneurial skills I think it teaches you a lot of different soft skills um, I think it's been a really cool learning opportunity especially as someone whose coursework doesn't usually deal with anything in the business side um, I think I've been able to learn so much more about what it takes to build a business um, and you know the project planning that goes behind it but also like the technical aspects of it and beyond just the technical aspects I think the soft skills that come with like learning how to pitch or learning how to represent your venture is so valuable just beyond the specific company and so I think I've been really grateful to be able to build something cool um, just because of everything of value that it teaches me. That's awesome so what is next for Caregiver what do you hope to achieve in the next five months and then maybe the next five years too if you have that vision in store already? Yeah, I think on a broad picture, we're hoping to launch Caregiver as soon to both the Apple and Android stores. And from, you know, the next five years um, perspective or even five months, um, we hope to increase customer density from different caregiving spaces, starting with the autism market, but also building upwards. We hope to also reach into the corporate partner landscape um, as we establish customer um, value proposition in the consumer market. Awesome. So how can people listening here today get involved with your venture or be part of this journey somehow? Definitely. So feel free to reach out to us at our email and we'd love to send you a link to our waiting list um, for when our app drops. And also feel free to follow along um, on our different socials, which I will send along. Last question. Do you have a parting message for our listeners today? What is something that you want to leave them with? Um, I think... I would just give them like a message of going out and trying new things. Um, I think I would encourage all of our listeners to be brave, not perfect. I think that's also something that Girls Who Code says a lot, which um, I am also a really big fan of. But I think it's so true. I think as, especially as individuals still in school, um, there's like so many different options out there. There's so many cool opportunities. So the more you get to explore and the more you, like new people you get to meet, there's so much to learn from them. Um, and there's so much to learn from the world just out there beyond what's in the classroom. So um, I think I would encourage everybody to just be courageous, be bold, um, and try new things. I think there's always something that cool like that might come out of it. There's always something cool that might come out of it. Everyone always says that the next generation is the hope of our future. And it's people like Nishi that help make that true. It was a pleasure to talk to you, Nishi, and I hope you guys listening today enjoyed our episode as well. As always, have a wonderful day and thank you so much for listening. Thanks, Sam. Now let's turn to our lifestyle correspondent, Thea Lawson, to talk about GW's next festival. Thanks for tuning in to our final G Week episode of the year. With the end of the academic year fast approaching, congratulations are certainly in order for all students, especially for the graduating class of 2023. For this episode's lifestyle segment, I'm highlighting an excellent opportunity for you to celebrate the accomplishments of our seniors while enjoying astounding performances hosted by the Corcoran School's NEXT Festival. The NEXT Festival exhibition is a showcasing of the capstone projects of Corcoran students. Held every spring for the past decade, the NEXT exhibition is a look into the dynamic musical performances, research presentations, and visual exhibitions in appreciation of the fine arts at GW and the talents and scholarships of graduating Corcoran students. This year, the NEXT exhibition has evolved into a festival format so that attendees can experience a glimpse of the future of the fine arts for an entire month. The 2023 festival began on April 20th and runs through May 20th. Director Lauren Anki describes the next festival as an end of the year celebration of exceptional art and performances of graduating students. The festival is a collaboration of all the Corcoran School programs, including art history, design, interior architecture, music, museum studies, studio arts, theater, and dance. The festival schedule is robust, filled with various concerts, showcases, lectures, presentations, panels, and exhibitions. Although the festival has already started, exciting upcoming shows include the jazz and hip hop showcases on April 30th, the art exhibition open from May 3rd to 20th, and a symposium in art history research presentation led by professor and art critic Aruna D'Souza on May 5th. 
For more inf information on exciting upcoming events like the next festival extravaganza and music series featuring GW's accredited musicians, visit the Corcoran School's 2023 Next Festival website to register and claim your spot. The website also features a campus map, parking information, health and safety policies, and a roster of the graduating class and other student projects to check out. Most events are free, except for the dance concert, which costs $10 for students' admission. Events are located across campus, including the Hammer Auditorium in the Corcoran Flag Building, the Dorothy Betts Marvin Theater, and Lisner Auditorium. Don't miss out on this unique festival and opportunity to enjoy the artistic talents of GW seniors before they take their gifts with them into the real world. I hope to see you there. You know, I'll take any excuse to go see um, what the Corcoran students are able to do. It's always so cool to see all of the dances and all of the art and everything that they do there. And I'm really excited. I think I'm seeing the orchestra concert Ooh, in a couple okay. days. So. Amazing. I have a lot of friends. I, w I was a choir kid my freshman year, so <laughs> I sang with the university choir. So I have a lot of friends who are in it this year, wow. and I'm going to go hopefully see them if I can make it. But all the artists are just so phenomenal at GW. Thanks, Thea. Buff and Bloom began last week from April 10th to the 15th with many exciting events for GW students to enjoy this spring semester. This is the first year of Buff and Bloom and is a beginning of a new tradition for the university to embark on. Memorable events include Lantern Lounge, Duck Stravaganza, and the Blossom Bash kickoff in University Yard. The week of spring-themed events created an escape for students to take a break from the stressful finals season. The lineup for the DMV's annual All Things Go Music Festival was announced this past week. The festival will be held in Meriwether Post Pavilion in Columbia, Maryland, an easy 45-minute drive from D.C., making it a favorite among GW students and other D.C. residents. Set to take place on September 30th and October 1st, the festival will feature headliners like Maggie Rogers, Lana Del Rey, and Boy Genius. Attendees can also expect to see Carly Rae Jepsen, Muna, and Lizzie McAlpine. General admission tickets start at $105 per day and are now on sale. That wraps up this episode. Thank you for joining us all semester long. For G Week, I'm Emma Grace Myers. And for the last time, I'm Morgan Miller. Thank you so much, GWTV. It has been an honor anchoring for you for the last few semesters. And I am joined today with our senior co-executive producer, Marisol, who will also be, oh my God. <laughs> Here you go. You guy. <laughs> She's crying already. I'm gonna cry. I'm sorry. I am so grateful for this show. Marisol is also graduating, so we will be leaving together, but we are so grateful for all of the opportunities and we love you all. All right, now I'm sad. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was really sad. I love you. <laughs> Thank you, GW. <laughs>